Well, good evening, everybody. Welcome to uh, Historical Theology. Again, we're looking at the doctrine of God and the Trinity. Um, this is the third lecture. I'm not sure how many I'm going to be doing, but uh, as we can progress from the early church up to the modern era, um, <clears throat> that is the scope. So that may be 15, 20, 12, who knows. So again, I, I thank you for, for joining us tonight. And uh, again, I just uh, pray that we are uh, we'll be going through this. We are just learning about how the the doctrines of the faith, specifically our doctrine of God and the Trinity, um, how they're developed. Uh, they're developed not in a vacuum, but in the context of of, of uh, <clears throat> strife, of dealing with heresies, of dealing with even refining our own thoughts as as the Christian faith continue to grow. And so we're going to be again just kind of exploring those uh, specifically in certain figures and. Um, yeah, so first I'm going to recap our last lecture, and then we'll get started for our new one tonight. <clears throat> so in our, in our last lecture, we looked at the Hellenization thesis. I looked at God as cause and first principle in Platonic and Aristotelian thought, and then we laid down the essentials of Christian Platonism. And the purpose of that was to delineate the, the elements and the concepts of Greek philosophy that the early church fathers um, utilized in the formulation of Christian doctrine, especially of the Trinity in our doctrine of God. And so um, it's important to kind of tease those things out. And <clears throat> I want to repeat again that the these concepts, um, these this framework, this philosophical framework, metaphysics, speculation, they call it speculative theology as well. You know, the, the fathers were very, very um, keen on making sure that that those thoughts were were subservient to the scriptures. Uh, in fact, in, and this is where there's a, a this distinction between the fathers and the heretics around them, is that the fathers understood that the, that the scriptures served as the guardrails or the parameters around the manner of speculation they were allowed to do. So um, we'll see that a little bit as we kind of kind of progress through this. But um, now it's also, under, also important to understand is that um, <clears throat> we want to make sure not to interpret or criticize the early church fathers according to the standards of today. Uh, you know, this was a time when doctrine was under development. Um, again, the Christian doctrine of God was a was forged during a period of about uh, roughly 70 years. 70 years from what, three, uh, 320 to 380, right around there, uh, 60 years, something like that. Um, and so there was a lot of, uh, you know, I guess you could say there's there was not a foundation to stand on like we have now, right? So they were trying to really, um, uh, you know, uh, make this make this make this come alive. I'm I'm losing my words here. Um, uh, to forge, they were trying to forge this doctrine of God based upon Scripture, based upon what we see in reality, based upon even just the standpoint of, you know, there's the objective objective things in reality that we're trying to make sense of and ultimately the christian worldview religion in general but a religion is supposed to account for all those things and so the early church fathers were in a in a, in a kind of melting pot of all these various um ideas and religions remember you were considered an atheist if you didn't hold to multiple gods um the christian claim was on one god uh, therefore considered an atheist. So again, the religion was the hotbed of this. So this was, worship was part of it. They didn't really have atheists as we do now in the same sense. So again, they're trying to deal with all the various false teachings, the false views that are trying to infiltrate, because why they think we can use this religion and add it to our other beliefs, our other views, our other uh, forms of worship. And that was the whole point of saying, no, that the Christian faith is exclusive. It's not like those things, not even close. So with that said, um, it's important that we say what? That all that is true is God's truth. All that is true is God's truth. And so the, again, when we looked at Aristotle and Plato, again, that's, those are just very small snippets of, of their ideas. Again, this is not supposed to be a, a class about those, but the point is that, <clears throat> that they had a conceptual framework that had ideas and concepts that, were, that embraced the true, the good, the beautiful, justice right these things they they understood that <clears throat> and because we know that those things do exist they come from god right those things do uh comport with the christian worldview and that was the the leg up if you will or the the what do you call that taking the, the high ground that the early church fathers um the christian faith in general was able to account for 
And so, so why is it? How are we able to say what these these things, these uh, you know, the, the pagans in a sense had, <clears throat> that we could ultimately say that this does in a sense add some some structure to the Christian Christian faith? Well, again, it goes back to Romans uh, chapter one, verses nineteen through twenty, where it says, "You know, being made in the image of God." Perceiving such things falls in line with what Paul said. He says what? He says, what can be known about God is evident among them because he has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, that is, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen since the creation of the world. So there are these things that God has shown to all of humanity that the scriptures say are clearly seen. And so that's ultimately the the stamp, the stamp upon humanity that we are made in the image of God and therefore we think thoughts after God does. And so the reality is that we fail as humanity because of the fall to connect those things directly to its point of true origin in Yahweh and the God of the Bible. And so while the pagans, while the Greek philosophers, while these really important thinkers for the world in general had these things that they perceived Okay, they didn't invent them, they perceived them, they could never locate it back to its origin. And that's what we have in the scriptures. So we have in the person of Jesus Christ is the origin, origination point of all those things that we know are universals of truth, justice, beautiful, goodness, morality, that kind of thing. The early church followers were able to say, look, you have this worldview, we have ours, you can't fully account for it, but in Christ... We can. We have the logos, and we already kind of talked about that last time. So, but anyways, but so it's back to that general revelation that allowed Plato and Aristotle to perceive the the that there's something about the world and God outside the the cave, right? The cave that fallen man lives in, and that was one of those things that Plato talked about as far as being in the cave. That you know, humanity in general is in that cave, just trying to feel around in darkness. But the lover of wisdom, the lover of knowledge goes outside the cave, wants to see what's out there that's be exposed, is behind everything, it supports everything. And so that's where, uh, you know, the, the Lord, <clears throat> you know, in his own purposes, you know, allowed Plato and Aristotle to see these things, to perceive these things, and for these ideas to really be perpetuated throughout, really, just the, the growth of, of human civilization. <clears throat> so, and then, and a great, you know, illustration is that as Christians, we can plunder plunder the truth of the world and it goes back to that concept where as the lord was bringing israel out of exodus he said that that the, i will put the that the terror of israel the fear of israel upon the egyptians upon the people and that um they will actually think highly of you and they will give you their gold they'll give you the precious stones all these things these riches these treasures among the egypt you'll they will give them to you you'll take them with you on your way out of Egypt. And so there's a, a saying that we have that <clears throat> I don't know if Augustine came up with that, but as we as they as the Jews plundered the Egyptians for their goods, we as the true Jews can plunder the Greeks or the Egyptians for their philosophical goods and precious stones that we can now use and apply to our faith. <clears throat> so but looking at this lecture, oh sorry, getting started on this lecture. Let's get the next slide. So we're going to look at, or we'll begin our study of looking at the Christian theologians of the faith. Right? We're going to be looking at the development of the doctrine of God in the Trinity, starting with the apostolic and the anti-Nicene church fathers. And so I'm not going to be covering every single father, because you can see there's only two that I really kind of mentioned a little bit in the first two. Because again, we're also looking at development, because the development of doctrine comes through um, their encounters with false doctrine. And that's really kind of how we get the theology that we have, is that we, we the, the Christian churches encounters ideas and ideologies that kind of press hard against the faith. And so we need to figure out how to respond to those, how to knock those down, how to, in a sense, inform those understandings, right? We also want to be, if Christ is the way, the truth, and the life, what we see in Revelation, in special Revelation, we should be able to correct or inform more fully uh, other views of reality, other views of, of, of theology, of, of religion, can inform those and ultimately shed light on those and show where they're deficient and show that the only true reality that makes sense is a life in Christ. <clears throat> so, um, again, I won't cover every theologian, just a lot of the main thinkers. And I'll just definitely want to uh, recommend this, that 
you want to pair this with Ch uh, Pastor Steve's uh, church history lectures he's been going through. And I think you're going to have that, this theology and church history kind of wedded together, and you'll kind of see this fully orbed picture of the growth of the Christian church um, as a movement, all right, and then as a theological development to what we have today. <clears throat> so again, I encourage you to listen to those. All right, <clears throat> so one God as cause and father, and I, I have that as the as the title. I don't know if you remember the, the last lecture was one God as first cause and principle or first principle. And so I'm kind of, in a sense, you know, taking that and now we're shifting it as we're taking this one cause, this, this, this first cause, this first principle, one God, and we're starting with the father. And so we're going to see some, some terms there in the early church fathers, and we're going to kind of continue to kind of build up, build on that in their writing. So, all right. So the early church continued <clears throat> in the tradition of the New Testament and its conceptual understanding of God. But in the, in the first generation of those that within the apostolic times, we, we call them the apostolic father, we, we start to see some reflections of, of philosophical theology um, that comes about from them. So we have figures like Clement of Rome, <clears throat> excuse me, um, Ignatius, uh, Justin Martyr, who was called the apologist, uh, Athenagoras, Irenaeus, Clement of Alexandria, and Tertullian, and uh, there's just a few as the church starts to kind of rev up and now becomes this vehicle to expand outward, right? There's this kind of full system of, the of thought that's developing to now be the kind of the vehicle that the Christian faith starts to move on. But, but in their writings, we find uh, similar attributions in the New Testament, such as God, Lord, um, Father, Most High, Majesty, Almighty, Master, and the Holy One. <clears throat> I got to keep it with my slides. Sorry about that. <laughs> um, but then we start to see other designations for God, such as the great demiurge, God of the powers and all creating God. Again, these are still these are still based on the fundamental ideas of what we find in Scripture. And in the text, we see in the biblical text, we see those these, these negative adjectives. They're called uh, invisible. Colossians 1:15, eternal. Romans 16, 26, and imperishable, 1 Corinthians 15, 50. And so the Apostle Paul uses these words. And so what these negative attributes do is they tell us what God is not. <clears throat> it's very it's very safe. It actually tells us quite a bit about God. And we will look into this in more detail as we, we come to some of the later thinkers. But that kind of gives us a, a language to, to not describe something positive about who God is, it tells us what he is not. Okay, and that's real important. And as we'll see later on, the challenge becomes that you see certain theologians, and again, I don't think that's their intention, but tend to emphasize more of these negative attributes to speak positively about God. But the problem is if you're just saying what God is not, then you're never saying what he is. And that's what we want to make sure that we're not going that direction. <clears throat> Excuse me. With that said, as we will see, following the New Testament era, philosophical constructs began to form in the Christian tradition, thus producing a, a type of language, albeit foreign to scripture, but yet necessary to precisely articulate the essence of the Christian God. <clears throat> so the transition into the second century posed great challenges for the church and the competing philosophies of their time and their cultural milieu, as the phrase is. And so in this milieu, the question that came up was, how do Jerusalem and Athens align? How does the Bible and philosophy align? How can these competing views become compatible? Should they mingle together? And that's where I mentioned the last, the last lecture that we have contemporary theologians that don't, that are, don't like a classical view of God, as, as we've been talking about, from the Greek tradition, and I'll be using that phrase more, and they say that that God, this very stoic God who's, you know, again, it's the negative descriptions that seems like becomes the, the primary way of speaking about this God, doesn't really speak of the God of the Bible. And, and there's some validity to it. So the assumption is that there's been so much emphasis on this negative attributes of God that the, the contemporary you know, um, critics say this came from the early church fathers borrowing wholesale from Greek philosophy their concepts of deity. And so that's, again, that's the challenge that we're trying to work through. And so that's, that's a big part of my purpose here in these lectures is to, is to work through that, to kind of really, to really show that, again, there was a, 
there was a um, compatibility between speaking about God, what he is and what he's not, that the early church fathers were very, were very safe. And again, you're still going to have some people that are a little bit off and you're always going to have that, right? But, but generally speaking, they were very safe because they, they, they were dealing with a competing philosophy of God, of Greek gods. And if anybody knows anything about Greek gods, uh, they were tyrannical. They were lustful. They were, um, basically they were the image, they were made in the image of man, right? And so instead of us being made in the image of God, you had Greek philosophers, you had, you know, and, and I don't, I mean that loosely. Greek philosophers is, is going to be different than those that are basically your kind of everyday worshipers, right? Because Greek philosophers definitely did that were, again, people like Plato, Aristotle, and then you have the, the, the thinkers that kind of fall in their, in their same kind of stream of thought. They definitely were critical um, because they see how there was a lot of um, of, of the passions. I and mean, we passions in the Bible we know is is a, is a bad thing. Passions, Paul never uses it to speak of like how you're passionate about something in, in a way that we may talk about it. Passions are always, it's the flesh. It's the flesh having the control of what is right, what is good, what is true. And so the problem is the the pagan deities, the pagan gods, were were really erected in the image of fallen man. And so with the early church fathers operating in that environment, they were developing concepts to 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 remove God from that lump, that lump of these type of gods. And so the language does speak about God not having any passions. And so the problem in our modern context is that when that was spoken of about God, saying not have any passions, the thought was that God isn't a passionate being, that God doesn't have feelings, doesn't care. Now, again, feelings, feelings is, or a lot of people get into trouble because God isn't a human. Now, obviously Christ is in the flesh, but the divine essence isn't human. So it doesn't have feelings and emotions in the manner that people do. And so, again, that's something we're going to iron out as we continue on in these lectures. But I'm really going off script, so let me let me get back to these things. <clears throat> let me go back. Okay. Um, so I mentioned that, you know, doctrine isn't developed in a, in a vacuum. Rather, it comes to life through a particular context or, or controversy through which the doctrine is developed or refined, or in some situations, sorry, backwards, where the doctrine might be, might have greater precision and clarity, or it just might be developed as, as a whole. And so that's what we see in the doctrine of the Trinity, the deity of Christ, the doctrine of God. Obviously, there was these foundational concepts we got from the Bible, but there wasn't really a full, a full orb theology developed to have a, a greater substance when we, when we speak about the doctrine of the Trinity as a doctrine, right? We see the New Testament forces us into, okay, it forces us into seeing that there's three divine persons, right, and one divine essence, and not really seeing how it all works conceptually, um, apologetically, theologically, um, and also um, cosmologically, too. That's another part of it, and I don't know if we'll get into that piece, but um, again, so all these things had to be developed. <clears throat> so, so a new body of doctrine becomes the guiding revelation for the second century Christians, but much work is to be done considering the church's identity being that of Christ because of its affirmation that there's only one God who is the father of Jesus Christ, who is also God of God. And that's, it's a revolutionary term. This, this triune, first we have a kind of a, um, uh, uh, what do you call that? Uh, uh, <laughs> not piety. We have... What's the word? I forgot the word. Well, basically, right now, there's right now there's a duality, right? There's a duality in the one God. How do we account for that? And then we have to speak of the Spirit, who now makes it a a trinitarian, a, tr a trinity of one essence. And so, those are very challenging you know, ways of trying to think about God, really foreign to the the views of God uh, in the surrounding uh, surrounding people, surrounding worldviews. So, while ph philosophers argued for the sake of arguing. Early Christians were in a hostile environment and had much more at stake. It was the health of the church and their eternal lives. Now, again, persecution comes about through submission to the lordship and sovereignty of Christ. That's where persecution starts. So while it may be thought that, hey, it's, you know, we don't want to see Christians persecuted. I don't want to see, obviously, any of my brothers and sisters being persecuted um, for their faith. The bigger threat is not the persecution. The bigger threat 
is the health of the church and the health of the church diminishes if it's theology if it's doctrine right sound doctrine is not retained and continue to be to be um, proclaimed to the continuing generations and people may think well doctrine divides but really it does divide it separates the sheep from the goats now so while persecution really in a sense you're going to be persecuted for your right doctrine and paul or uh, jesus was very clear about that and i'm sorry paul was too um so we can't always think of that it's the church being persecuted how her- terrible that is and, and that is but persecution is a sign that you are actually following christ and you're carrying that cross but the ones that that leave the ones that are not persecuted it's because their theology is, could be very corrupt. And that's what ultimately was at stake uh, in this period. And again, we also do, didn't want to develop a theology that took anything away from the work of Christ, took anything away from who he is, what he said, what he's done, our salvation. Salvation was a really huge, was a huge part of that. I mean, if, if what was developed or refined uh, somehow diminished, tainted, didn't exalt the salvation of humanity as God's free merited grace, um, that had to be it had to be left. It had to be taken away. It had to be thrown away. And so that's where that refining piece uh, comes through. That the church, early church, had to really uh, contend with. Um, so the Christian religion did not have the appearance reflective of the surrounding philosophy that it quickly developed in, because of its uncompromised commitment to the Bible. It had greater organization and coherency as a religion compared to. The pagan religions it, it rubs shoulders with. However, Christian doctrine developed through an incorporation of Platonic ideas, providing a, a substance metaphysic that aided the faith in constructing its doctrine of God. Christianity thus became a philosophy. Now, if you recall from this, the last lecture, I talked about Adolf von Harnack, who wrote that um, kind of kind of started the Hellenization thesis in, in saying that the true Christian faith got away from being religion and became a philosophy. But he was greatly mistaken because I think he was pitting one against the other. Whereas we see Jesus as a you know as a as a, as a leader, a, a rabbi that's you know that's teaching, you know, very sound ethical principles and uh, very, very clever in his thought. And again, looking at again, Harnock was looking at Jesus not I think in the in the right light. Um, but really Jesus had a philosophy. The way, the truth, and the life. That represents a philosophy. And so it was just kind of a natural, a natural um, you know, process for the early Christian faith to develop into a philosophy. It's a it's it's true wisdom. How can you say it's not philosophy? So again, um, but this stage is where it really be, kind of came this way because now the Christian tradition was having to engage and comp- con- excuse me, contend with the philosophy of the day, the philosophy that would reign supreme. And so, and we see that, you know, Paul, Paul challenged the, in, in, uh, in Athens, he, he challenged the philosophers. He went there presenting a philosophy. And so they wanted to hear this. And so again, the Christian faith is continuing to boom and to bustle and to now be on the stage of having these ideas that can challenge the greatest philosophy around them. Um, but but what's important is that unlike the philosophers of the day, which cared more about logic for its own sake, they kind of preferred and, and they, they liked debate for the sake of debate, right? Christian philosophers were first and foremost Christians. They weren't philosophers in the sense of going around and having debates and being rhetorical in their, in their, in their way they you know, promoted their ideas and stuff. They were first and foremost Christians, so they were following their Lord and Savior, the Jesus Christ of Scripture. <clears throat> So, the difference between Christians is they, they use the tools of philosophy for the sake of consistency and coherency in expositing what the scripture teaches about God. As the church encountered Christian heretical opposition that promoted aberrant views of God and Christ. So, the, the philosophy aided the arguments. The philosophy helped the theological arguments that we pulled from the scripture and then we kind of gave this kind of um, this framework to now facilitate these ideas and show a greater coherency from the scripture. And again, um, the philosophy is always the handmaiden. Philosophy never is the is the master of scripture or of theology. And, and later on, we'll see what happens when a philosophy now has greater weight when it comes to the teachings of holy scripture. So Christians committed committed to the authority of scripture 
use what align with their convictions as derived from the scriptures, making Christian philosophy, in fact, Christian theology. Early Christian fathers primarily adopted aspects of contemporary philosophy to address the skeptics of their time, using it as a tool for evangelism, and as I said earlier, the handmaiden of theology. So the abstract terms of philosophy, such as impassibility, immutability, incomprehensibility, omnipotence, omniscience, omnipresence, and so on, provided a manner of speaking intelligibly about how God could become man, yet as man be also God. I mean, that is a revolutionary idea that still is one of the most challenging things to discuss. Uh, people come across it and say, how could a God become a man? Right? That was just... Um, Total mind blow, total mind blow. Now, the problem is you had some people kind of, in a sense, you know, kind of bleeding these concepts into the Christian tradition that the that the Greek philosophies had their 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 god, their pagan gods of you know Zeus and Achilles, these dogs that were actually kind of like mutants, right? They were semi god, semi man, and that's not what we have in the Christian scriptures. So there was again a lot of confrontation, working out those ideas, making the clear distinctions between. The gods made in man's image, in the God in His in image in which we are made. So, so <clears throat> the the Gentile philosophers had a view of reality as the taon. That's Greek taon, which means that which is a, a supreme impersonal being. Now, to defend the God of the Bible, the Church Fathers established that God is transcendent, yes, personal. Oh, sorry. There we go my slides, is transcendent yet, yet personal, not that which is, but rather he who is. Ha'an in the Greek, ha'an, an, inf an infinitely greater view of reality, the supreme being of the cosmos made flesh in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now at this time, Gnosticism was a pervading threat of heretical teaching in the early church, and we learn about that even in in the, uh, uh, the Johannine epistles, um, and I'm sure people have heard that phrase before, um, but differences between Christian and Gnostic teaching did not stem from variances in language, rather it was a worldview issue. So Gnosticism believed in the possibility of a higher level of spiritual knowledge, or gnosis, meaning knowledge, and recommended various means of achieving this higher spiritual state. Gnostics tended to depreciate the material world in favor of the spiritual spiritual world. And so what came from this is what we call kind of dualism. That there's a an evil and a good dualism between matter and spirit. Matter and spirit. And so that was really kind of that was kind of really the, the central idea of the day that there that physical things like people, flesh was bad, but inside us contained these spirits that were pure and good. And the spirits needed to be released from the from the evil flesh, the evil body, and to be to go off into into eternal bliss and goodness. But the Christian tradition, the scriptures don't teach that. And so, again, that's another way of having to, where the Gnostics were able to kind of get in it sometimes and be a threat to the church. But we had to continue to call out these false teachers, these wolves, and get them out. And so, through that, we refine our theology and what, what scripture teaches as a whole. So, again, the, the early Christians saw God as the transcendent creator, but Gnostics saw God as a distant, unattached negation of the world. Again, very impersonal. It was an unhistorical, syncretistic, syncretistic, okay, syn means together, kind of wedded together, way of thinking, kind of bringing both thoughts together. Making use of philosophical concepts and schemes with often outlandish interpretations. They claimed a higher way, negligent of faith, reason, and knowledge. It was more about having this this um, um, this esoteric knowledge of things. So if you have this knowledge of everybody else, it kind of made you this very elite group. And so the problem is only select few could actually be part of this, right? So so Valentinus, or Valentin, Valentinus, however you want to say that, is, is a, was a, a Gnostic, though closest to Orthodox Christianity, he proposed an emanation theory that suggested that God's being is developing out of a primal, mysterious unity into a series of powers or ions collectively called the pleroma or fullness of the Godhead from which God had arrived at an incomplete conception of himself. It already sounds ridiculous, doesn't it? That's crazy. How do you even really understand that? A primal mysterious unity. What does it tell us? Nothing. Collectively call, called the pleroma, which is Greek for fullness of the Godhead. 
So the way this thought works is this process then repeats itself, becoming a series of powers that are other beings that emanate, okay, that emanate, that God has imparted himself to, which have moved away from the initial unity, thus diluting perfection and making allowances for sin. So as the emanation happens, right, these these pieces of <laughs> of primal unity, or these powers, these aeons, um, they if they've moved away from the center, sin gets in. Sin and evil gets in. And so again, it's a very, very weird way of looking at things. But now the, the early Christian response to this, to this question of its God as the starting point in physics, logic, and ethics, and these were key points of co coherency in Stoicism. Now, real quick, Stoicism is was characterized by a conviction that the universe has a rational structure and that whatever happens does so with necessity, right? They're kind of very deterministic. True virtue requires an acceptance of external events. So the virtuous person lives in accordance with the reason that shapes the universe and gains contentment by an attitude of indifference to the external goods and evils that most people desire and fear. So the thought was that if you're a Stoic, and you may have heard the phrase, you know, why is he so Stoic? He has no look on his face, right? That's the point is that you have control, that you don't allow your body to be disturbed by the passions, by the things that upset you, by the emotions, by all these things that, that tug and pull at your at your being. Uh, this, those who are Stoic can stay Stoic, right? And this is also a, um, a misrepresentation that we hear from modern theologians that the views of God that is that I talked about being, you know, the negative attributes, that's why they call him a stoic God, that there's no emotion, there's no feeling in God, he doesn't, anything that happens, he just keeps his face stoic. But again, that's a misrepresentation, and it's more or less, that focus paints the picture of the Greek gods, not the God of the Bible, that the early church fathers were only purpose was to keep him separated from that man, man-centered, man-made view of God. Um, so Greek thought understood, oh, let me go back. I'm going to re re restate a point I said. So the early Christian response to the question of his God as the starting point in physics, logic, and ethics was that God is the mon monarchia, the monarchia or monarch, right? So he's the sole ruler of all, which kept them aligned with the Old Testament doctrine of God. And we know obviously the Old Testament, uh, Deuteronomy 6, 4, right? The Lord is one, the Lord is one God. So that oneness that monarchia, that ruler of God, rulership of God, that was kind of the foundation where the Christian response to the Gnostics and the other views of the time kept God, the true view of God, away from that. So as I said, so Greek thought understood of history in cycles. So the Old Testament and New Testament scriptures teach that there's one timeline with a beginning and an end governed by God, the monarchia. He is the Alpha and the Omega. He is the beginning and the end. And the first understandings of Christ were that he was either subordinate to the Father or he eclipsed the Father. Again, the early church is trying to make sense of Christ in his relationship to the one true God. But the problem is both those concepts were insufficient, but at some level made sense of the biblical account. And thus we have the emergence of a nascent Christian theology. Nascent means like an emergence or a new beginning, right? The, the nascent of Christian theology. So... Theology is is developed through trying to make concepts coherent. So that's the real important part of that. So again, the only reason this really developed is why? Because trying to figure out who is Jesus ontologically speaking, right? We talked about ontology, metaphysics. So ontologically means of the essence or nature of being. So so in what relation does Jesus, the Logos, have to the Father? And as like I said, some subordinated the Son to the Father, right? Or he eclipsed the Father and became this new God. And there was views of, of the Old Testament mean God and the New Testament loving God. And that's the one we ultimately is the true God. And again, the Christian scriptures, Old Testament, New Testament, are coherent as a whole. And so we have to interpret it in light of how those texts inform each other. Specifically, the lens of the Old Testament has to be seen through the New Testament. So, so God as creator is one of the chief designations in reference to the God of the Bible. And when the apostolic fathers speak of him as creator, the foundation to the doctrine of creatio ex nihilo is assumed. 
Creatrix nihilo means created from nothing. We'll develop that later. In the sense that God, quote, made out of what did not exist, everything that is. And that's a quote from the Shepherd of Hermas. Uh, it's an early Christian doctrine or early Christian writing where we actually see um, other people that are, you know, outside of scripture developing the idea. I will probably always do that in every video. <clears throat> uh, again, so I'm going to repeat what he said. So, uh, that God made out of what did not exist everything that is. So, so one, the apostolic, apostolic fathers were committed to monotheism by which they confess that God is the true and only God. In holding to the divine transcendence and absolute monarchy of God were of primary importance. Okay, primary importance. So, emphasis on these aspects, along with the free sovereignty of God, arose due to the challenge and threat of polytheistic and pantheistic teachings. So, this following statement from the Shepherd of Hermas, I say, encapsulates the foundation of the second century Christian doctrine of God. And it says, God is one who created all things and set them in order and made out of what did not exist everything that is and who contains all but is himself alone uncontained. Ooh, and where's my 10th slide? Hmm. Okay. Um, should have another slide in there, but I guess not. So when reading the Apostolic Fathers, we do not find a well-developed metaphysical doctrine of God. Again, we have this statement that there's a lot to it, right? And so, but again, this, if you look at it, it's trying to say really a lot of that has to do with what God isn't, right? And um, those get more, um, even saying uncontained, but contains all, right? If we're trying to really use phrases and terms conceptually to help us say what God is not, but to also help us say and understand what God is. But again, this was developed through, as we said, challenging and threats from polytheistic and pantheistic teachings so then we have to develop a robust doctrine of god from scripture that shows us clearly distinct from these other philosophical and religious ideas of the day um <clears throat> so as i mentioned as we progress we will see this this metaphysic take shape and i'm, I'm only going to offer a sampling from some notable figures but with more attention to the greater contributors in the development of the doctrine of God and the Trinity, and we'll kind of get to those later on. As you'll see that when I get to some of these key thinkers, we'll talk in more breadth about them because they have more to say. They have more to develop. They have more theology to contribute. So, so with that said, this study will not get. I'm sorry, this study will not also expound or get wrapped up in too many of the historical details. And again, I mentioned about listening to Pastor Steve's church history class to really kind of help fill this in for you. But so the aim here is to trace out the development of the language of the doctrine of God of the great tradition. So when I say great tradition, I'm talking about the tradition of, of the Nicene, uh, the Nicene theologians, anti-Nicene, um, even moving into, um, uh, what's it called? Uh, post nicaea I'll explain what those are in a little bit, and into the medieval thinkers. So these that kind of imbibed this classical view of God that we're talking about, the the negative attributes, the omnis, all those kinds of things are real characteristic of what's called the great tradition. I mean, the great tradition is what we say is the foundation for um, our exegesis of understanding the Bible when it comes to the doctrine of the Trinity, the deity of Christ. All those things form that great tradition uh, together, and um, we'll see how that kind of you know kind of uh, unwinds and develops. But now, obviously, our study is historical, right? It is historical theology. Therefore, some attention to history is important because the context has a, a catalytical import to the formulation of such language within the theological culture. And that's um, important. Again, no theology is done in a vacuum. And as, and as language starts to change and take different, different uh, kind of different hues, the language that we use to explain a concept could can actually kind of mis can be misunderstood or or you know kind of create a a, a, a misconception of things like for example um, emotions emotions and God is a big thing right now the word emotion was an 18th century development I mean as far as talking about human emotions it's very new but it's so big in our culture right now that it has a theological bent to it now when we're speaking about God that people continue to start thinking that God is 
has emotions like people do. Because what happens is they're they're taking the the person of Jesus and they're taking that what he is in the flesh and um, uh, projecting them up onto the divine essence of the Father and the Spirit. And obviously, if the Son, the Son, is a divine essence, all right, the divinity of Christ can't suffer, can't have emotions. Again, those are words I'm talking about humans. And the divine essence can't suffer. Why? Why? He can't suffer. He's eternal. How can he suffer? How can he, how can he repent? The divine essence doesn't repent because the divine essence doesn't sin. But we see that kind of language used in the Bible. And so the problem is now that many thinkers are now, again, confl- uh, uh, misunderstanding and misappropriating terms. And we now we get a theology that's kind of really a little bit more down into the, the, the ground of the, of the earth instead of actually in the heavens above. All right, so our first character is Ignatius of Antioch. He died around 107. Um, don't know his birthday, but again, this is this is an apostolic father, so he was born during the time of the New Testament authors. Um, and he is said to be the closest in thought to the New Testament writers. He's got some letters he wrote. He wrote quite a bit, but he's famous for his letter he wrote while en route under armed guard to Rome to suffer martyrdom. And he wrote the churches and the cities as he passed through, encouraging them to remain united in the faith. And that picture I have is obviously is uh, supposed to be a picture of him. And now, as you'll see, I'll be using pictures of, of various theologians, but, I mean, they're not true pictures, right? They're just kind of these artist portrayals of them, right? So, But they tell a story. Here he is uh, being thrown to the lions in the middle of the Colosseum as what was the common thing for uh, to happen to Christians at this time. But, but outside the New Testament documents, his letters were extremely important witnesses of the development of church structure and theological reflection. Ignatius faced opposition by Christian docetists who taught that Christ only seemed to suffer. And that was what more the, um, the Apostle John was dealing with in his letters about those that were antichrist, were those that denied that Christ had come in the flesh, right? So that was the idea of docetism. Now, docetic means to think. So it says to think he suffered. They figured that the idea is that he didn't really suffer, right? Because again, this is where we have a true idea, a true view of God, but not properly interpreted and understood from the text. So they, they, they really thought, well, they didn't really think he suffered because if Christ is God, true God is eternal, cannot die. So it was it just a show, right? But again, so what they did is to they they went extreme to one side and said no, that can't be, and they denied the fact that Christ is God in the flesh, and that's what John was saying. The Antichrist is the one who denies that the second person of the Trinity took on flesh, or the Son of God, right? As more language, the Son of God took on flesh and is still in the flesh, as the text says. But for the Docetists, well, sorry, again, they they they. It was, it was more like a show to them. He only appeared to be that way. But Ignatius, excuse me, burp. Ignatius, to maintain Christ's humanity and his deity, this by all means we have a paradoxical position, he establishes a third step in the Christian doctrine of God to express and maintain the incarnation. He says that Christ is eternal, invisible, and impassable, yet he is human, visible, suffered, and died on the cross. So this is where the Incarnation allows us to make a theologically accurate statement and say that God died on the cross. God died on the cross. As uh, Richard Grant points out, he says, In the church before Ignatius' time, such language, one, had been currently used in regard to God the Father, and two, had next been applied to Christ as God. So one particular phrase, Ignatius conflates the, the language showing the ontological oneness of God and Christ. And this is what he writes. This is what Ignatius says. He says, There's only one physician of flesh and of spirit, generate genatos, and ingenerate agenatos, God and man, true life and death, son of Mary and son of God, first passable, pathetos, and then impassable, apathes, Jesus Christ our Lord. So, I'll go to the next thing here. So we came across two terms there, generate and ingenerate, which really means begotten or unbegotten. And I have some definitions here. So begotten is what? It's the personal property of the son that consists in his relation of origin from the father. We call that filiation. That is to say, in his mode of being relative to the father 
who begets him. And I'll explain more in a second after we talk about unbegotten. So the unbegotten is the property of the father who has no origin. The father is not begotten and does not come from a person. So we would say he is without principle. He is unbegotten. So the son's begotten, the father's unbegotten. The son is begotten. Why? Because he comes from the father, his point of origin. Now, it doesn't mean that there was a time where he was not. Is that the relationship, right? This mode of being relative to the father who begets him. So it's a way of making a distinction between the father and the son of the relations. So we say the father of the son is always related to the father as the one that was begotten, that's come from him. And the father is the source, is the principium, is the monarchy, right? And so that's how we retain our um, divine essence that's one, right? But our unity of God, but also our plurality that we see that we can still say that we are monotheists, right? And we can also, again, going back to his point where he said what? He said that there's only one physician of flesh and of spirit, generate, right? And ingenerate. So in one sense, by by an, uh, Ignatius making the connection of the uh, generate one to the ingenerate, God can be in man, true life and death, son of Mary and son of God, first passable, then impassable, Jesus Christ our Lord. So, again, we have very paradoxical statements here we're trying to keep in a, in a consistent structure. And the whole point is not so much about logic, it's about grammar. It's about how to speak of these things that make sense of all of it, but also does not diminish or corrupt any of the of the pure truth of scripture let's see i'll go back there so <clears throat> so again back to ignatius i think i'm talking about ignatius uh, actually i'm citing john bear here john bear real good theologian he says of ignatius his expression above is as close as ignatius gets to a two nature christology on the one hand his purpose is to emphasize that Christ's human existence came through human generation, right? We beget children. Christ was begotten through human generation, but also he's eternally begotten from the Father. So again, back here. So uh, on the one hand, his purpose is to emphasize that Christ's human existence came through human generation. Thus, it was real and not docetic. And that was the whole point that the Apostle John was trying to keep out of the church was that view that he only appeared or seemed to be in the flesh but no we have a true flesh a true flesh union between god and man right so it was real and not docetic and on the other on the other hand he was divine pre-existent and ingenerate existing not through birth but not sorry but having no beginning again you could say of the person of jesus that he is what divine that he has no beginning but well, we can say the person of Jesus is human and has a beginning. And both those statements are okay because we're talking about the person of Jesus. And so we will look more at, at some of the um, the two nature Christology developments later on. I didn't really include it a whole lot in here, um, but I'm, I'm sure at some point I'll have to kind of get into it. But, but anyway, so, so very distinctly, Ignatius writes, quote, There is one God who manifested himself through Jesus Christ, his son, who is his word that proceeded from silence? The one Lord Christ was passable, subject to all things that belong to created being, such as change and death. Nevertheless, through his death, he manifested true life and impassibility. Now again, Ignatius was died a little after 100. So this is stuff that he's developing, that he's 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 taking the, the torch, if you will, from the New Testament authors and continue now to develop theology. Again, he's in a context now that the, the early church writers, specifically only John, started to kind of really get into, right? I mean, Paul, you can see in some of his language, there's that negative theology we talk about a little bit, um, but ultimately that becomes more and more of a pressing issue for the development of doctrine in the Christian church, and ultimately for the gospel. So, uh, again, back to um, uh, ethics. Athanasius, excuse me. <clears throat> so in his letter to the Romans, he writes a letter to the Romans church as well, same one as Paul did. Ignatius, Ignatius, not Athanasius, sorry. Ignatius expresses one of the central aspects of the Christian confession in that Christ's passion was not the suffering and death of a mere man, 
but rather it was the passion of God. And he says, It is better for me to die on behalf of Jesus Christ than to reign over all the ends of the earth. For what shall a man be profited if he gain the whole world but lose his own soul? Him I seek who died for us. Him I desire who rose again for our sake. This is the gain which is laid up for me. Pardon me, brethren. Do not hinder me from living. Do not wish to keep me in a state of death. And while I desire to belong to God, do not yet... Do not you, or ye, ye, give me over to the world. Suffer me to obtain pure light. When I have gone thither, I shall indeed be a man of God. Permit me to be an imitator of the passion of my God. So, end quote. The Incarnation was not just a story. It had ethical, theological, and metaphysical implications. But the problem of one God was a serious obstacle in that for the Christian story to make sense as a coherent body of true, revealed teaching, the story of salvation, the story of creation to recreation, with Christ as the center, the claim of one God, one God as Father and Son, and one God as first principle, needed to be reconciled in a precise grammar to do so. And this was the first task in properly ordering the structure of Christian theology. So again, with Ignatius, that statement then, He's talking about, we, we just mentioned how God doesn't have passions. But again, we're talking about the divine essence. Obviously, Christ in his humanity has passions. And so, um, the way it's being used, though, is not like how Paul used it. It's basically making a point to say that the passions, the patheos, is of the sameness of human nature. And he's trying to stress that point. So again, he's taking these paradoxical thoughts, these concepts, and weighing them together that by themselves, if you go to the extreme, if you go one side or the other, you're going to be guilty of heresy. But if you keep them together in tension, it's actually not heretical to say God suffers. God died on the cross. God had passion. Because why? He's referring to the special revelation of Jesus Christ in the flesh, who is fully God as the Father and the Spirit is. <clears throat> All right, so that ends our little look here at Ignatius. Now we're going to move on to Clement of Rome. He died around 100, was a presbyter and bishop in Rome. Now, Origen, who's a church father we'll get to later on, he claimed that he is the Clement mentioned in Philippians 4.3. But uh, theologians say it's more probable that he is the writer of Clement, who is listed in the Shepherd of Hermas, a Christian writing from the mid-2nd century. But in the few documents that we have from Clement, we see that he, he does not have a developed uh, metaphysical or speculative doctrine of God. So when I say the word speculative, that means concepts and ideas that, that seem foreign to the, to the Bible, and so we call them speculation or speculative, but it doesn't mean like, um, in a sense, that someone just kind of like just trying to speculate and has, doesn't really have an idea. It's just a way of trying to speak about God in terms that we don't see expressed directly in the Bible, um, but we use them to develop our doctrine of God. Um, but again, back to Clement, um, he... In his writings, he, he emphasizes the shared titles, names of master and creator between God and Christ. And he, stay, he stays very close to the scriptural appellations consisting, consisting, uh, consistently excuse me, expressing sovereign lordship over the universe. Now, there are those that, and you know, again, kind of modern critics now say that the early church didn't look at God's sovereignty like we do today. Now, granted, they didn't have the same attention, but it was very, very um, distinct in their theology that God is the master, the sovereign Lord of the universe. He is the creator of all things. Because why? The doctrine of creatix nihilo was one of the chief doctrines of the early church because that was that's the difference. None of the, none of the other um, religious views around them denoted that their, their deities created everything. Everything. But because God is true and he's the only God of the, of, of the world, he is creator of everything. Everything, and so that was one one uh, chief aspect of the Christian tradition that was um, heavily emphasized in the early church writers. Excuse me. Uh, Clement even gives the title "Master of the Universe" um, to the Lord Jesus in his First Clement, and it is a common title that we see often of Christ. But he uses it elsewhere, speaking of God in general as the All-Seeing God and Master. Uh, interestingly, interestingly, reference to the Incarnation is scant, with the only explicit statement in 2 Clement 9.5 where he says, Christ, 
became flesh, even though he was originally spirit. But a Trinitarian formula is intrinsic. Whoops, sorry, flipping the wrong thing. But a Trinitarian, Trinitarian formula is intrinsic to his monotheism. When he writes, have we not one God and one Christ and one spirit of grace that was shed upon us, right? Doesn't that term sound familiar? When we think of the baptizing in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. He says, have we not one God, one Christ, one spirit of grace that was shed upon us, right? So a, 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 a Trinitarian thought of action in one, right? Upon us, right? It was shed upon us, the grace. Um, while Clement speaks of God as the father and maker of the whole world, he also attributes creator status to Christ, calling him, quote, the great creator and master of the universe, end quote, who providentially guides all things, seasons, oceans, seas, winds, and all living things. Um, encouraging his listeners to trust in God's promises and to remain faithful, he also wants them to have a proper fear of him, and he reminds them of God's power as the creator who, quote, by his majestic word, he established the universe, and by a word, he can destroy it. Now, Clement's warning implicitly expresses his understanding of the, that God creates ex nihilo. And then a few paragraphs later, he expounds further, offering an explicit statement that affirms ex nihilo. Clement writes, he says, For the creator and master of the universe himself rejoices in his works, for by his infinitely great might, he established the heavens, and in his incomprehensible wisdom, he set them in order. Likewise, he separated the earth from the water surrounding it, and set it firmly on the sure foundation of his own will, and the living creatures which walk upon it, he called into existence by his own decree. Now, I don't know if you picked up on the language about wisdom, by his word, right? All these things. So, Christ the Logos is the word he is the wisdom of god the power of god it's first corinthians 131 i think so 131 maybe it's 121 but yeah it's a famous designation that says but paul says christ the power of god the wisdom of god so and he says here he called he called living creatures he called all who walk upon it he called into existence by his own decree so the word speaks the word speaks and creates so uh, and in what is the oldest complete Christian sermon that has survived, which is referred to as Second, Second Clement, speaking of the grace of God and having compassion and mercy, Clement writes, quote, We had no hope of salvation except that which comes from him. And even though he had seen in us much deception and destruction, for he called us when we did not exist, and out of nothing he willed us into being. So again, Clements, a very, very early, early writer, speaking in these terms of out of nothing. Now again, there's no explicit Bible verse that says God created out of nothing. But the creatio ex nihilo term itself was forged within, okay, within a theological battle. That's the thing. So, so because the the, the the term itself isn't found in the Bible, the term comes to life through the theological engagement that's going on in this time. So obviously, again, the whole point, the whole point of this word is to say explicitly what the Bible teaches about God explicitly. And that's kind of always the challenge. That's what the early church really ran into was the manner of grammar. How do you say these things? How do you, in a sense, take terms that are different languages and, and how do you explain them? To, how, how can you use them to explain what the Bible teaches in a way that's coherent with the scriptures? <coughs> Excuse me. Man, my throat. So, Clement's speculative doctrine of creation is based on the implications of biblical passages about God as transcendent over or from the universe. Transcendent means he's beyond the universe. He's beyond physical reality. He's transcendent. He's, he's everywhere through it. Not that he is a created creation thing, but he's everywhere um, all at once. There's nowhere that God isn't. There's nowhere that he's not. And in one sense, you could say God is nowhere because if you say he's somewhere, that means you're putting God in a location, right? So, yeah, it's very, very precise. So, in fact, um, as we will see throughout the study, the Creatio Ex Nihilo doctrine of the great tradition is a normative assumption derived from the text. Creation is a product of God's will. He, he decrees that something exists and he wills it into being. 
Now, in Clement of Rome, we do not see explicit essence language deployed, seeking to articulate a divine grammar for God in say. Rather, the names of God hold firm in his thinking, but we do see the emergence of the doctrine of creative ex nihilo. So, there's a phrase I, I use, in say, it's a Latin term, so it's God in himself, in say. And so there's a grammar we need to be able to use to speak of what, it's really incomprehensible to us, but we have to be able to have terms to express things about the Bible in a manner that keeps the Bible consistent and coherent and ultimately supports what the Bible teaches. So we are done with Clement. Now we're going to get into the anti- Ah, oh, look at my slide. The, the. Dang it. Sorry about that. That's a rookie mistake here. Copy, paste, and double check my work. So, the, the. The, the anti Nicene father. So, real quick, the anti Nicene period, literally meaning before Nicaea, of the history of early Christianity was the period following the apostolic age of the first century down to the first council of Nicaea in 325. This period of Christian history had a significant impact on the unity of doctrine across all Christendom and the spreading of Christianity to a greater area of the world. Those seen as prominent figures of this era, referred to as the Anti-Nicene Fathers or Proto-Orthodox Christians, generally agreed on most doctrine while the teachings of those early Christian writers, which the general majority considered to be heretical, or rejected. So again, these are these are pillars of Christian theology. While obviously the apostles and the prophets are the pillars that we we stand on, right? And ultimately, Christ is that cornerstone. Again, the, the the Bible, in a sense, is not closed. The canon of inspired writings is closed, but the development of theology, the 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 proclamation of the gospel, the proclamation of Christian theology, is a continually developing organic or organic entity that's governed by God. And it's a way of how you how the Bible can encounter every type of worldview, uh, time period, issue, you name it, the Bible is applicable. And so that's what theology is. It's, it's a continual development and growth of the wisdom of the church, if you will. Not that the church has authority over scripture, but it's kind of a, a living thing, right? We're living stones being built up. All right, so we're going to now get into Justin Martyr. So... He's called the apologist, apologist of the faith. He was born uh, a pagan parents of parents in Samaria around 130, and he was converted from pagan philosophy to Christianity. He was still a philosopher, but was now teaching Christianity the true philosophy. His appearance marks a distinct shift in the audience of Christian writings to that of pagans. In, in Justin, we see a greater level of of sophistication in his theology than in Ignatius. Again, we're seeing this develop more and more and more. So a Greco-Samaritan provides an account of Justin's pilgrimage through Stoic peripatetic. Now, peripatetic is basically um, is regarding those that would be a teacher who works in different schools. Peripatetic means he's kind of walking around. That's what that word kind of means. And so he's walking around and works in different schools, and he's very much a an Aristotelian thinker. Again, he's a philosopher converted to uh, the Christian tradition. And he says it, it taught him nothing about God. There's a famous story about him, and we're going to kind of talk part of it, where Justin has his discussion with this old man about the Christian faith, and so we'll kind of walk through that right now. Excuse me. So, in the ideas and concepts he derived from Platonism, excuse me, that of incorporeal objects, transcendent ideas, when, when, when Justin became a Christian... By having those thoughts and then having the Christian tradition come together, he says he really felt he had wings to his mind. Wings to his mind. So in his retelling of a discussion he had with an old man, in which he, he is asked to give a definition of God. So the old man asked Justin, give me a definition of God. And he says, quote, that which is uniformly and consistently always the same and provides the cause of existence for all other beings, end quote. Is that blah? I mean, yeah, it describes him, but you can see that's coming out of out of Justin's heritage of of a philosophy, right? So that's kind of the best he can come up with. Where it's it's a, it's a true statement, right? I mean, there are definitely those things we apply, but he's missing a, a, an important, the most important element, which he now talks with the uh, old man. So the old man was a Christian, and he agreed with him. Like I said, this is true. He re, he agreed with him, reflecting the common. Christian philosophical theology of his time, of this time. However, 
knowing this God is of greater importance for the Christian, right? Knowing, not abstracting, not conceptualizing, knowing this God is of greater importance for the Christian. So the old man's questioning Justin regarding his knowing of God shattered Justin's Platonism because a Platonic view could never bring a creature into a relation with the divine essence. Justin turned to divine revelation in the Old Testament, which ultimately led him to his faith. Again, Platonic philosophy did not lead one to the Christian faith. Rather, it stimulated his thinking of the beyond in a conceptual framework. Revelation, right? Revelation was the key to a true knowledge of God. Now, Augustine went through the same thing. And when we get to, to, to Augustine, we'll probably elaborate a little bit. I forget what I've already covered with him in my writings, but um, same kind of thing. He he could he could use the the, the concepts derived from, from Greek philosophy, gave him this kind of, in a sense, understanding, but not a knowing, right? And that's what special revelation ultimately did for, for Justin and did for Augustine. Um, all right. Now, two central concepts on the nature and being of God shared between the two views are, and again, this is what I'm talking about, um, Justin, uh, Justin's thought, right? So it says here, um, these two concepts shared together. So one, that God is immutable, uncreated, eternal, and imperishable. And two, he is the ultimate cause of all that exists. He is the ground of being. Again, these are very, see, these are very negative words, immutable, uncreated, right? Imperishable. Eternal is even a negative word too, right? But then we say he's the ultimate cause of all that exists. He is the ground of being. So he's using this phrase that everything that has being, everything that exists, right? God is the ground of that. He's the origin of that. Now here's what Justin says. These are his actual words. He says, God alone is unbegotten and incorruptible, but all other things after him are created and corruptible, end quote. He says, God is the creator of all things and, quote, is superior to the things that are to be changed, end quote. So while the old man criticized Justin for his religious knowledge of God, he was on common ground when it came to the nature and being of God. And Justin rejects literal interpretations of biblical metaphors that depict God having arms, feet, or these aren't feet, I can't show my feet, hands, hands, feet, a soul like a composite being. We say God is simple, which we'll learn more. God is simple. Humans, creatures, are composite. Again, these are already concepts that are prevalent in the theology and philosophy of the Christian tradition. God does not come down or go up for anything. Either when the, So when the Bible says that God went up from Abraham, or when God came down to look at the Tower of Babel, or when God shut Noah into the ark, um, those aren't literal happenings right god physically didn't take shape and do that um but there's these are terms that we're trying to we speak about god as a personal being and this is why and this is the reason why justin says this he says the ineffable father and lord of all neither has come to any place nor walks nor sleeps nor rises up but remains in his own place wherever that is quick to behold and quick to hear having neither eyes nor ears, but being of indescribable might. And he sees all things and knows all things, and none of us escapes his observation. And he is not moved or confined to a spot in the whole world, for he existed before the world was made. And I've already kind of mentioned that, right? We can't, Even saying God is nowhere is not accurate, because we're assuming there must be a location even in that phrase. And Justin really obviously gets this. So in response to those who claim that Justin was entirely dependent on Plato for his doctrine of creation in the fallen excerpt, we see that it was Plato who was dependent on Moses, who gives the correct story. See, in the ancient world, it was common that the older source was considered authoritative over the newer one. And Justin follows this same approach. He shows a cohesive acceptance in Plato and Moses in that we agree with Moses as we should that God created ex nihilo and with Plato that God shaped what was formless into a form as Genesis 1.2 posits. Um, key to understanding creative ex nihilo is that the doctrine asserts matter does not exist eternally alongside God. Again, this was a 
major point of contention in these discussions, which is why the early church fathers, um, specifically the, the, the apologists they call them, were really trying to emphasize God as sovereign creator and maker of the whole universe, everything created, uh, everything that was created at God. Um, didn't use any you know matter alongside of him at all that he matter existed alongside of him but but ultimately all of creation comes from God so God doesn't literally create from a box of nothing that's that's doesn't make sense when we say from nothing we mean from nothing else but God himself did he create so here's a long uh, a long uh, sentence from uh, statement from from Justin about this he says, Hold on, my jaw's getting sore. Justin says, And that you may learn that it was from our teachers, we mean the account given through the prophets, that Plato borrowed his statement that God, having altered matter, which was shapeless, made the world, hear the very words spoken through Moses, <coughs> Excuse me, who, as above shown, was the first prophet and of greater antiquity than the Greek writers, and through whom the spirit of prophecy signifying how and from what materials God at first formed the world, spoke thus, quote, In the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. And the earth was invisible and unfurnished, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved over the waters. And God said, Let there be light, and it was so. End quote. Justin continues, So that both Plato and they who agree with him, and we ourselves, have learned, and you also can be convinced, that by the word of God, the whole world was made out of the substance spoken of before by Moses, and that which the poets call Erebus, we know as spoken of formerly by Moses. End quote. And lastly, about Justin, so he affirmed the sovereignty of God, in a sense, making it something that 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 defines or gives the credentials of true divinity. And this is what he says about this. He says, Whence we become more assured of all things, he taught us, he being God, since whatever he beforehand foretold, <coughs> excuse me, should come to pass, is seen in fact coming to pass. And this is the work of God, to tell a thing before it happens and as it was foretold, to show it happening. End quote. So, Justin a Justin. So Justin, he appropriated the philosophy of his time to buttress the doctrines of Christian scripture. He was an apologist, so he was encountering the ungodly worldviews of his time. He was defending the faith. He was also taking what was good and true and right and showing how the Christian worldview can account for it. He was destroying lofty arguments, showing how their, that their, their framework of thought was inadequate to account for all of reality. Because the truth is, only the Christian worldview can account for objective truth claims, logic, ethics, the origins of the universe, and the ultimately the consummation of the ages. That ultimately all of creation has a telos, a, a, a point of completion that God is bringing it to by his providence. So, all right, done with Justin. Now we're on to Theophilus of Antioch. Theophilus of Antioch. So little is known about him. But he was the first to apply the term triad when speaking of the divine Godhead. As Bishop of Antioch, he died around 188. He proffers, that's just more of a sophisticated way of saying offers. <laughs> you just put a PR in front of it, right? He proffers a strict transcendental monotheism stating that God's form is, quote, ineffable and inexpressible. There's no words for it. We can't even fathom it, right? That, that, that's the divine essence. So, in his writings, Theophilus offers a, a litany of appellations regarding, regarding the nature of God. To note just a few, he says, God is incomparable in power, unfathomable in greatness, and unrivaled in wisdom. God does not have a beginning because he was never brought into existence, thus he is immutable. Again, if we'll see in his language right here, right, we're seeing all these negative descriptions. Incomparable, unfathomable, unrivaled, um, never into existence, and he's immutable. Now again, we have to remember, he's saying these things because of the theological context he is in. His point isn't to speak something positive about God, it's to express what he isn't to combat the ideas of his day that was in a sense infringing upon 
the true gospel, the doctrine of Christ, and ultimately what Scripture teaches. Right? The whole point is not to make them like the human gods. So, so teaching against the Platonic concept of the co-eternity of God and matter, again, this is the context, Theoph- Theoph- yeah. Theophilus writes, quote, If God is uncreated and matter uncreated, God is no longer to the Platonist, the creator of all things, end quote. So Theophilus was showing the inconsistency in the Platonic view that claims God is the creator of all things, yet matter was eternal. So one thing I want you to, to recognize in what I'm saying from Ignatius is that he is, as, we, as, I, as I mentioned, he is not using Greek philosophy wholesale. Wholesale as the critics today contend. Rather, what's he doing? He's, he's not using it to, to, to formulate his doctrine of God by the entire system, right? He recognizes there's things within Platonic thought that are heretical. Again, the Platonists didn't have it right. Again, there was things that they recognized, but only through the divine revelation in Scripture and, and in Christ can we then really have this, this fully fleshed out, orbed understanding of God and his relation to all of creation, right? That goes back to my opening opening paragraph, my first lecture, right? God and all things in relation to himself. That's what theology is determined to exposit and articulate. Again, so but but God is uncreated, thus unalterable. So if matter were like God, then matter is what? Uncreated and unalterable. God's power is supreme in that he did not create out of existent materials. For what great thing is that, Theophilus says. Rather, he manifests it by making whatever he pleases, quote, out of things that are not, end quote. Now again, it's not about he's taking things. He's looking into a... A, uh, he's in a workshop looking at a table of nothing and then make something from nothing. The point is that all things are created from God alone, right? Nothing that exists came into existence apart from God. And because of God, he is un- wait, sorry, and because God is uncreated, he is not needy like the created. He is, stands in need of nothing. Again, that's another phrase that's getting a lot of controversy in modern theology about God doesn't need anything. So therefore, God doesn't need people, and he could easily just get rid of us. Now, the point is not to say that God doesn't have a need, right? The point is that God's love is so superfluous, su- superfluous, so um, it's it it like a fountain. We're going to see that term later on. It's a fountain of living water, of love that continually just pours out that because God is the giver of everything, he isn't needy like a creature is. We were made to need existence. God is existence. He doesn't need anything because he is what he is, right? All he has is from him. He doesn't need anything. He is life himself, life, sorry, life in himself. So we want to make sure, again, we're not taking terms and turning them, turning them around and, and taking them out of context to say something about God that was never intended to say about him. All right. So I'm going to continue. Hold on, drink. So, so God's act of creating was through, quote, his own word eternal within his own bowels begat him, emitting him along with his own wisdom before all things, end quote. Now notice in that phrase, the anthropomorphisms, right? So basically, anthropomorphism is using human language to describe the divinity. So he says here, what do you say? His own word internal within his own bowels. God doesn't have bowels. Now, bowels does actually mean, you know, inside the essence of God. That's what he actually means. But again, here he is using words in a way that we can understand where the, the bowels the word being the bowels was our inward parts, was the innermost of who we are. So he's trying to make a point using this anthropomorphic language. So the word, the quote, governing principle, the RK, the beginning, being the spirit of God, power of the highest, made the heavens and the earth to make himself known through his works, right? The heavens display the, the work of his hands, right? So in, when in, in Genesis 1, 1 through 2, when it says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth and the earth being without form and void and darkness was upon the face of the deep and the spirit of God moved upon the water. This sacred scripture, Theophilus writes, quote, teaches at the outset to show that matter from which God made and fashioned the world was in some manner created, being produced by God, end quote. So the matter used in the forming of the earth was first created by God. 
So in Theophilus, we have here a great example of philosophy being synthesized with Scripture, with the sacred Scripture having primacy in doctrinal formulations. All right, that was a quick trip with him. Uh, we are now going to be talking about, excuse me, Irenaeus. So Irenaeus uh, lived around 120 to 202. He was the Bishop of Lyons in southern France and was one of the most important Christian writers of the second century. Irenaeus grew up in Asia Minor under the preaching of the Apostolic Father Polycarp, who moved to southern France, becoming an elder or presbyter in Lyons. So what we go through in this section, we're going to be kind of looking at his standard work against Gnosticism. So we really only understand Gnosticism because of what he has done, what he what he wrote, the because he was challenging the view. So a a, a properly a properly um <clears throat> what's the word a theological treatise that is worth its weight wants to exposit the true ideas. So therefore, whatever he's going to challenge, the reader right knows the context, and the reader understands the arguments being made, and then by in a sense expounding on their views. He then, the person that's writing the treatise to to counter it, is then now going to attack those views. They're going to go after those views. And so, so my point is that we don't really have a lot of writings from actual Gnostics. What we do have, the majority of what we do know about him, is through uh, Irenaeus's writings. And so his his famous work here is called um, Against Heresies. So, so he opens Book Two of the Against Heresies with the confession of the one Creator God, quote, who made heaven and earth and all the things that are therein. Very standard, right? There is no one above him, nothing before or after him, nor is he influenced by any one or thing, but created all things by his own free will. So for Irenaeus, God is the only Lord and only creator, the Father alone, containing all things, and himself commanding all these things into existence. End quote. Irenaeus, um, though theologically sees that God is incomprehensible and is known only through Christ, he adopts the Platonic framework that God is the source of all good things. Again, there's truth that's there, and he's adopting it, right? Man can be devout and religious, speaking of God, as the source of all that is good, with the same view of God being inscribed in the biblical text. Irenaeus speaks of the folly of those who, quote, endow God with human affections and passions. So again, that's a problem. That's why, that's why he's staying in it. The, the, the tendency of humanity is to make God like himself, or like, like humans, right? Human affections and passions, and we know that divinity doesn't have that. Because affections and passions, we associate with humans, with creatures, not with God. We would say that God has perfections. Perfections because love, justice, mercy, uh, jealousy, right? When God does those things, they are wholly perfect and good, and they come from the proper seat of divine essence. So, which means is, when God is demonstrating those, the, the the manner that He demonstrates those is the perfect, true way of being demonstrated. So, example, that's why God's grace is not like human grace. God's unmerited favor flows from His goodness. With creatures, our grace would always have some type of catch to it, where it's tied back to what what makes us feel better, or it shows our bias towards things. God is goodness itself, goodness itself. And so what he does is always the, the epitome of perfection of what anything he demonstrates, uh, uh, how it should be demonstrated. <clears throat> so, where was that? Okay. Um, so he writes, again, about those that show that God has human affections and passions. He says, quote, If they had known the scriptures and been taught by the truth, they would have known beyond doubt that God is not as men are, and that his thoughts are not like the thoughts of men, for the Father of all is at a is at a vast distance from those affections and passions which operate among men. So Irenaeus is one of the first to express the idea of God's transcendence. When he writes, quote, We possess eternal duration from his transcendence, not from our own nature. End quote. And then Irenaeus articulates the classical expression of the simplicity of God with the implications from the previous statement that affections and passions, or emotions, right, are not proper to him. Let's look at his statement about this. He says, He is a simple, uncompounded being, without diverse members, and altogether like and equal to himself, since he is holy understanding, and holy spirit, and holy thought, and holy intelligence, and 
and holy reason and holy hearing and holy seeing and holy light in the whole and the whole source of all that is good even as the religious and pious are wont to speak concerning god so this is where we start to see our doctrine of divine simplicity really take root now the whole point of simplicity is to again is to say what god is not so we are saying again that god is not made of parts and you'll see that in your historic christian confessions that came later on um following the first few right now my i'm trying to so there's the creeds confessions uh athanasian creed um for some reason i'm going blank on those but we'll talk talk about it later on but okay, the point is that that again we're, we're, we're he's countering a view of of divinity that is not true divinity so that's what he's going to, that's what he's going after that's why he's making the the points that he is to say that god is not made of parts and so the thing is why why is that important so the whole point is to say that if God creates from himself, that God created all things, that God is the origin of all things, that means God has to be who he is from himself. Because if he has parts, okay, then the parts are actually greater than the whole, and something that was before anterior to God had to give him his parts to make who God is. Therefore, if that's the case, then there's something beyond God that is truly good and greater than the god that we worship in the bible so simplicity was to say that god isn't made up of parts that he is who he is completely from himself so whereas creatures were composite what we are composed of essence of existence of material of soul god isn't he is existence he is who he is from himself all right now the last this is a very long statement from irenaeus in his book of against heresies Again, he's responding to pagan claims that God has an animal nature. His response, I say, is a wonderful expression of the complete uniqueness of God apart from all created things. And he ties his description of God into the scriptures as the Lord of all in his triune operations. So this is a long, this is a long paragraph. I need to, need to get my mouth watered here. Okay. <clears throat> He writes, He, the Creator, made all things freely and by His own power and arranged and finished them, and His will is the substance of all things. Then He is discovered to be the one only God who created all things, who alone is omnipotent and who is the only Father, founding and forming all things visible and invisible, such as may be perceived by our senses and such as cannot heavenly and earthly quote by the word of his power and he has fitted and arranged all things by his wisdom while he contains all things but he himself can be contained by no one he is the former he is the builder he is the discoverer he the creator he the lord of all and there is no one besides him or above him neither has he any mother as they falsely ascribe to him again dealing with heretics nor is there a second God, as Marcion has imagined. And Marcion was a major heretic at this time that wanted to divide the Bible um, in the old God, the new God. Um, nor is there a pleroma of 30 ions. Again, this is back to Gnostic theology, very weird stuff. Which has been shown a vain supposition. Nor is there any such thing as Bythus or Proarchy. Proarchy. Nor are there a series of heavens. Nor is there a virginal light nor is there an unnameable ion, nor in fact any one of those things which are madly dreamt of by these and by all the heretics. But there is only one God, the Creator, who is above every principality and power and dominion and virtue. He is Father, He is God, He is the Founder, He is the Maker, He is the Creator who made those things by Himself. That is through His Word and His Wisdom. Heaven and earth and the seas and all things that are in them. He is just. He is good. He it is who formed man, who planted paradise, who made the world, who gave rise to the flood, who saved Noah. He is the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, the God of the living. It is he whom the law proclaims, whom the prophets preach, whom Christ reveals, whom the apostles make known to us, and in whom the church believes." He is the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ through his word, who is his Son. Through him he is revealed and manifest to all to whom he is revealed. For those only know him to whom the Son has revealed him. 
But the Son, eternally coexisting with the Father from of old, Yea, from the beginning, always reveals the Father to angels, archangels, powers, virtues, and all to whom he wills that God should be revealed. End quote. <clears throat> Thus, the handmaiden of philosophy, Irenaeus derives his understanding... Sorry, I just blew that sentence. Thus, with the handmaiden of philosophy... Irenaeus derives his understanding of the essence and attributes of God from Scripture. So that's a really, really, I think, a great quote that sums up everything we're talking about. And we're at our conclusion. So, there is much more that can be said about Irenaeus, especially he wrote quite a bit. Um, again, he is a foundational thinker of the Christian tradition. And like I said, his, his writings on the Gnostics actually gave us an understanding of who the Gnostics were and what they taught. Um, but if you're in... If, if you are interested in reading more from these guys, I highly recommend these writings I have on the screen. Um, the the popular patristic series from St. Vladimir's Press, you can get those on Amazon. And they're just kind of these little small, they range anywhere from like 80 to 120 pages, maybe some of the longer. Um, just various treatises and little books that these guys wrote. So they're fresh translations, so they're, they're more contemporary. Um, highly recommend them. You can get them on Amazon and use for like, you were from like probably 10 to 20 bucks. I got probably about four or five different volumes, maybe more. And then the St. Justin Martyr and the Apostolic Fathers in English. You can, I mean, you can find all this stuff for free online as well. I prefer to have book form. But again, if you want to read more from these guys, I highly recommend these sources. And um, yeah, really, really good stuff. So thank you for your time. I hope this is very helpful. And we will see you on the next lecture, uh, lecture number four. See ya. Bye.